All right, this is very exciting. Um, thank you for having me. I know you're wondering what happened. I just freaked out the a cappella band on their way out the door. Um, so I, um, I'm here today talking about a subject that is very near and dear to me. It's about transforming lives in the greatest city in the world and my favorite city, which is Chicago, Illinois. And um, that's right, we love Chicago. Are they serving alcohol today? I mean, <laughs> but the, the thing is, um, as I get started, I want to give a shout out. The gentleman on the screen is really a legendary figure in orthopedics and really a reason why I would be here today. He is Sir John Charlie. He is the pioneer of total hip replacement. Pioneer. Amazing. In the United Nations, he was a physician that had an innovative idea to change the world. Dr. Charnley's innovation has brought improved mobility and pain relief literally to millions around the globe. It's one of the greatest surgeries that I know how to do, and from what I see in my patients, one of the best tolerated and just about the best surgery in all of medicine. Um, do you mind if I do a demonstration? Okay, here we go. So here's the deal. This is the human femur. When it becomes arthritic and diseased, we have options. Before Dr. Charnley, the only option was to leave it alone or just cut it out and let him go. With his pioneering invention of hip replacement, it's amazing because we actually mechanically reconstruct the hip. This is a human femur, and what I'm going to do, I get to use power tools and hammers. That's a good day in my universe. Keep your fingers away and watch out for flying debris. I like that. So what I just did, I cut off the femoral head. In most instances, that would make me a felon and send me to jail, but I actually get paid to do this. And I'm going to give this up to the crowd. So what we do, it's, it's really a process. This is mechanical. Replacing a hip is something that is very methodical. I've done thousands of times, and we do it the same way each time. So what I'm going to do right now, this is an intramedullary reamer. I'm going to put it down the femoral canal. A rongeur to eat away some of the bone and make space for my hip prosthesis. <laughs> Looks wicked, doesn't it? <laughs> so I'm going to take the mallet, and this is the brooch. We're going to expand the opening in the proximal femur. And we go up size by size. I got style points for that move. <laughs> and here it is. Here's the magic, the hip prosthesis, the femoral implant. Bam. And then we take on the articular surface. And there it is. It's really very simple. <laughs> if you look at what the point is of a hip joint, it's basically just, it's a ball joint. You have it on your truck, you got it on your pickup, you got it on your car. But it's a joint that allows mobility and it removes pain. So this is the net result. And now, what I just showed you is how to replace a hip. I can take any one of you and bring you up here. <laughs> Not on your hip, 
but I can teach everyone in this room how to do it. It's not complicated, right? <coughs> you saw the steps, it's reproducible. What's very difficult is to try and heal human beings. That's the challenge. The orthopedic implant industry, think about this. If hip replacement is one of the greatest techniques and technologies in modern science, with a 98% patient satisfaction rate, but it's widely unavailable to poor and minority patients in the United States. The orthopedic implant industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. Innovations in trauma, screws, rods, knee replacements, spinal fusion devices, cages, pedicle screws, rod, the list goes on and on. Yet all these fantastic innovations remain widely unavailable to minority and poor patients who more so than not need them more than anybody else. I'm going to digress for one second while I get out of my spacesuit. I really freaked out that acapella band, you can't imagine. <laughs> So I'm going to digress one second because really my story starts right here on Northwestern's campus. It was in 1981. I was a freshman that year. So I came here as a highly recruited All-State and All-American prep basketball player, very, very excited to play for the Wildcats with a hope to one day become a professional athlete. Then bam, disaster struck. I blew out my knee, boom, in a blink of an eye it was gone. So here I was, just yesterday I was the All-American boy. It was now three major surgeries later, depressed, despondent, disillusioned, and now disabled. Wondering what the hell I'm gonna be doing with my life from here on out. So I did what any angst-riddled college male would do. <laughs> I joined a band. <laughs> it was pretty cool. <laughs> nice segue, right, to rock and roll. But the thing was that for five years of my life, I had an amazing opportunity. And that was to be mentored by some of the legendary blues musicians here in Chicago. They taught me about music, but more importantly, they taught me about life. I mean, you know the names, Junior Wells, Homesick James, Eddie Taylor, Magic Slim, Otis Rush, meaningful. I eventually did get my head back together. I went on to finish medical school at uh, Northwestern downtown, and um, I did postgraduate training in trauma. I did a fellowship in adult joint reconstruction and also in spinal disorders. I did find my meaning. meaning was to uh, help people that society chose to ignore. We formed the Bone Squad. <laughs> I thought I had to get a cool name, right? I mean, <laughs> not gonna be like Dr. Dan's and his guy, you know, that seemed kind of ridiculous. So the Bone Squad had to have a cool logo, <laughs> wore bell-bottom pants, had big afros, kind of like, you know, the old Mod Squad. And we had, a, we had a mission. I mean, we provided orthopedic care to Chicago's underserved communities. And I know you've heard these places, they're in the news every day. Roseland, Austin, Humboldt Park, Lawndale, Jackson Park, and Englewood. Chicago has 1.5 million underserved, underinsured patients that need this type of care, and we were proud to do that. Um, I took a position at the Cook County Bureau of Health at Provident Hospital. This created a direct conduit where these patients could access me for the service that they needed. One of the things that bothered me the most was that within Cook County, it was a case study in racial healthcare disparity and discrimination. I trained at Rush University. While working at Cook County, prior to my arrival, the average wait time was four to five years to get a joint. While at Rush, it was four to five weeks. 
Musculoskeletal disorders are the greatest cause of disability and chronic pain in the world. The bone and joint decade was brought together in order to increase awareness and resource in treating this, but nowhere in their platform did they ever address racial disparity and access for poor. I mean, look at these numbers. I mean, look to your right, look to your left. One out of two adults in America suffer from this condition. I mean, look at me. I'm a textbook case, a six foot 10 case of chronic disability. 13 knee surgeries later, my right knee looks horrible. Every time my patient complains about knee pain, I put up my x-ray and they go, ooh, that looks horrible. I go, yeah, shut up, that's my knee. <laughs> You know, in healthcare, we talk about being able to project equality. It's BS. We talk about it, but we don't prove it. African American women are six times less likely to be offered a total knee replacement than Caucasian women. Minorities with diabetes are five to six times more likely to end up with a below knee amputation. And the outcomes of minorities and the poor are, five, are in the bottom 20%. It sucks. The cost to, to society is incredible, $800 billion a year, almost 6% of our gross domestic product allocated to musculoskeletal care for things like fractures, back pain, arthritis. And with an aging population, these numbers are only gonna increase. I co-founded with my wife, One Patient Global Health Initiative in the aftermath of the Haitian earthquakes. I was there as a first responder in the middle of just calamity and disaster, death and dismemberment. And I sat there in the middle of it and I said, I don't know what to do. I can't fix this problem. It's bigger than me. But what I could do was affect the life of the patient that was in front of me. The challenges are complicated for musculoskeletal disease. As I showed you here, you can fix a broken bone. But the issues that affect patients are much more broad than that. It's not just the bone. It's a whole body that you're treating. It's a human being. The mission is simple. Heal the mind, the body, heal the spirit. At one patient, we treat all patients, regardless of ability to pay, without prejudice. The obstacles are very significant. When patients come in my door, even with the Affordable Care Act, resources are limited. They come to me in disease states that are far advanced. Patients have comorbidities. They're obese, they're diabetic, they smoke, they have behavioral disorders, they're depressed. You got to treat the whole human people, not just the knee, not just the an ankle, not just the back. The economic impact is significant for what we do because we keep patients engaged and in their community, functioning and in their community. The impact is huge. Nursing home care is fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars a year for every year we keep a patient outside of the nursing home. It's a win. My patients are amazing people. Truly, I learn from them. And once they advocate for themselves and they learn how to take ownership of their health care, it's amazing. Here they are. I have been very blessed to get access to this care. Um, without having insurance and being underemployed and all the other things that inhibit getting quality care, Without this place, I really don't know where I would be today. My arthritis has limited me from gardening, from mowing the lawn, from shoveling, from um, going up and down the stairs, you and, name it. Uh, I begin to help spiritually with this, not as well as just physical. And I have several things in life that, you know, I go through, through because of the change in my life, the way I have to adapt to my pain. Um, without this particular type of program, I would think I would be really, really downsized because my limitation was very, very intense. It took away of a lot of joy in my life to where this made a big difference. This program needs to be implemented nationwide because there's a lot of people like myself who utilize these services. I do want to thank you for listening to me. The understanding is that all of us have the ability to make a change in this world. You can transform lives just like we do one patient at a time. 
the most important thing you need is compassion and bring your empathy. Thank you.